If we were to tell you a story about a young archaeologist from the University of Chicago in the 1930s who was called upon to save ancient artifacts from the hands of raiders and 'er ne'er-do-wells, you might say, wait, I've heard that story already. But perhaps not this one. Nonetheless, we shouldn't get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's begin our story a bit further back, to the first part of the 19th century, when the area that encompasses the Winfield Mounds was first formally acquired and settled by the Europeans, and when the groundwork for the modern survival of the Winfield Mound site may have been inadvertently laid. Historical Native American tribes lived in the DuPage County area until the late 1830s, when an 1835 treaty with the U.S. government finally pushed them out. But make no mistake, this was their land, and they, their kin, and their ancestors had lived here for thousands of years. The most prominent tribe in the DuPage area at the time of the European settlement was the Potawatomi, who, together with the Ottawa and Chippewa, were known as the Confederacy of the Three Fires. Although the Potawatomi had served the United States in the 1832 Sauk Uprising led by Chief Blackhawk, European settlers and the U.S. government were nonetheless keen to move them out and to take their lands. By bullying, encroachment, and the ratification of the 1835 treaty by the U.S. Congress, the Potawatomi were removed from the area, first to Missouri and Iowa, and then to Nebraska and Kansas where their numbers dwindled to less than 1,000 people. Interestingly, the village of Winfield, just south of the mound site, as well as the DuPage County Township of Winfield, took their name from General Winfield Scott, who played a major role in the Black Hawk War, in which the Potawatomi had faithfully served. With the 1835 treaty, the U.S. government took over formal ownership of Potawatomi land, first surveying it, then organizing the land into square mile sections as part of the township and range surveying system, and then finally making it available for private purchase via a series of land patents. The area around Winfield Mounds was first made available via these land patents that were issued and assigned in the 1844 to 1849 timeframe. As it happened, 10 individuals acquired the land from the U.S. federal government within the one square mile or 640 acres, that encompass the Winfield Mounds area, with the most acreage acquired by Proctor Price Cooley, including the land upon which the mound and village site were situated. In another interesting convergence of stories, Proctor Price Cooley is buried in the Jewell family plot on Champion Forest Court in Wheaton, Illinois. You may remember this as the cemetery that we discussed briefly in our ca and Elgin Line video as part of the Jewel Road station description. The Cooley family intermarried with the Jewel family just to the east, which explains why Proctor Cooley's gravestone is located in the Jewel family plot. By 1874, much of the Cooley land had been acquired by Caspar Dahm, a young Bavarian immigrant who worked for the railroad as a station agent. Caspar Dahm married Margaret Hahn and started a family before eventually moving to Nebraska, where he passed away in 1900. According to census records, Dom appears to have sold his property in Illinois by the late 1870s. The mound site on this property was likely only known to locals at this time. The Albert Scharf map of 1900, which described Native American sites in the Chicagoland area in the earlier part of the 19th century, and which is believed to be reasonably comprehensive and accurate, makes no mention of either the village site or the mounds between Winfield and West Chicago. The DuPage County Platt map of 1904 introduces us to the next actor in this drama, as the land is denoted as being then owned by one Milton Player. Milton Player was born in Marshalltown, Iowa in 1874 to John and Charlotte Player, both immigrants from Kent, England. John Player was a machinist and worked as a foreman in a local machine shop. Young Milton carried on his father's trade, first working as a machinist and then finding his way to Topeka, Kansas, where in 1895 he met and married Elizabeth Reed, herself an immigrant from Northern Ireland. Census information indicates that the players started their family in Topeka, remaining there until sometime after 1900. Between 1900 and 1904, the players came to DuPage County, Illinois, 
where Milton appears to have put aside his machinist trade, instead taking up farming, specifically dairy farming, and obtaining almost 130 acres of the property originally owned by Proctor Cooley, including the mound and village site. With all of this discussion about the mound site land and how it was divided up and acquired, you may be asking, who cares? Well, it is important for a few reasons. First, it's important to understand that the land upon which this ancient site resides, the descendants of those people who inhabited this land, were pushed out less than 200 years ago. Secondly, and more pragmatically, the means by which the land was originally mapped and divided up may help to explain how these ancient mounds survived relatively unscathed into the 20th century. Note that the player farm, as was true of the Dom farm and the Cooley farm, was bifurcated by the DuPage River, with most of their property and their residence being to the east of the river. This meant that the land to the west of the river was likely not cultivated to any significant degree, but was instead farmed for hay, used to pasture cows, and also used as a managed woodlot, which had the effect of sparing the mounds and village site from heavy cultivation and farm machinery, assuring their survival. All of this was as an accident of Western cartography, as the land was surveyed and sold using the artificial divisions of the township and range survey system, rather than the natural division of the DuPage River. Milton and Elizabeth Player found their permanent home on this acreage between Winfield and West Chicago, farming their property, raising six children, and generally becoming pillars of the community. We know that Milton Player was certainly familiar with the Native American earthworks across the river on the back of his property. In 1926, he chased off two young men who had started to excavate a pit in the westernmost mound. They had dug down about two and a half feet in the center of this mound, but apparently found nothing of interest, not to them at least. A year later, Pot hunters went after the easternmost mound on the player property, this time digging out the center of the mound to a depth of five to six feet, going all the way down to gravel, the glacial moraine, where they apparently found charred remains, including shell beads, charcoal, and broken shell. Their excavation left a deep and 10-foot wide crater in this mound. Whatever materials were found were taken away by the vandals, yet somehow the information regarding what they had found was known to locals strongly suggesting that the pot hunters were local as well. The next character to enter this unfolding story is one Mr. Cook of Wheaton, Illinois. Wheaton is a small city due east of the mound site and the village of Winfield. We know nothing more definitively about Mr. Cook of Wheaton, except that he had an interest in archaeology and possibly Native American culture, and he seemed to have a rudimentary knowledge of contemporary archaeological methods. Based on U.S. Census information, the best guess as to Mr. Cook's identity is Edward Leroy Cook, an architect and draftsman who lived in Wheaton with his wife Helen and two daughters. Sometime after the two earlier pot hunting expeditions by local vandals, Mr. Cook obtained permission from the players to excavate the southernmost mound on the player property, which was then the only untouched mound of the Triad Mound Group. So sometime in 1929, Mr. Cook proceeded to dig a one and a half foot deep T-shaped trench with the base of the T at the center of the mound and the roof of the T skirting along the northern edge of the mound. Mr. Cook reported finding nothing in this trench. This is where our original storyline at the start of this episode picks up with the one now unfolding, as it was at this time, realizing that he was perhaps in over his head, that Mr. Cook of Wheaton contacted the University of Chicago for assistance in solving the mystery of the mounds. The University of Chicago in the 1920s and 1930s was a hotbed of archaeological research. The institution was sending young, newly trained archaeologists all over the world, primarily to the Middle East, but more locally across the U.S. Midwest, using the renowned Chicago Method as a more rigorous and disciplined approach for excavation of archaeological sites, at least for that time period. 
It is no accident that Steven Spielberg and George Lucas used the University of Chicago as the backdrop for their Indiana Jones series. Presiding over the vigorous and newly formed anthropology department at the University of Chicago was Faye Cooper Cole, who received his education at Northwestern University, the University of Chicago, the University of Berlin, and then finally at Columbia University in New York. Much of his early anthropological fieldwork was done in Malaysia and the Philippines for Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History. Once appointed as head of the anthropology department at the U of C in 1924, he became an ardent advocate of the Chicago method and spread this discipline by training scores of young archaeologists. When Mr. Cook contacted the University of Chicago regarding the Winfield Mounds sometime in the 1929 to 1930 time frame, Faye Cooper Cole assigned the investigation to one of his graduate students, George Carl Newman, who was only 23 years old and had immigrated from Hamburg, Germany, 10 years earlier. Mr. Newman was to be assisted by a few other anthropological graduate students, James Griffin, Fred Egan, and Jesse Jennings, as well as one of Faye Cooper Cole's spring semester undergraduate archaeology classes. And so it was that on Friday, April 17, 1931, in the depths of the Great Depression, Mr. Newman and no less than a dozen others from the University of Chicago descended on the player farm, spending the next two weekends investigating the mound site, unleashing their vaunted Chicago method, and uncovering the secrets of at least one of the mounds. Photographic evidence also indicates that Faye Cooper Cole himself visited the site, perhaps to check up on his students. Newman's first step was to take stock of the mound site and the earlier attempts at excavation. He gave the mound group the designation of the player mound group in deference to the landowners and assigned the tag DU1 to the westernmost mound, DU2 to the southernmost mound, and DU3 to the easternmost mound. The DU designation was short for DuPage. This shows that this excavation was among the earliest, if not the earliest, official archaeological dig within DuPage County. The team then took the vital stats of each mound, measuring DU1 as being 2.2 feet high and 30 to 35 feet in diameter. DU2 was measured as being 1.5 feet high and 28 to 32 feet in diameter. Finally, DU3 was measured at 3 feet high and 35 to 36 feet in diameter. Newman also noted the size, location, and extent of the previous excavations, observing that all of the excavations had been left open. Newman quickly settled on excavating DU1, the westernmost mound, perhaps because it seemed to have the least amount of damage to it, and so appeared to be the most promising. Using the Chicago method, they first dug three test pits outside of the mound area, about three feet square, to the northwest, to the northeast, and to the southeast of the mound, carefully noting the sediment stratification within each pit, with the purpose of establishing a baseline stratification for undisturbed areas, which they could then compare to what they found within the mound. Next, they staked out the entire DU1 mound area at five-foot intervals, creating a grid system of five-foot squares, 72 squares in all, with 10 stakes running 50 feet east-west and nine stakes running 45 feet north-south. The north-south line of stakes that ran through the mound center was denoted as the center line. North-south stake lines to the left of this center were labeled as L1, L2, and L3, while north-south stake lines to the right were labeled as R1, R2, and R3. The grid system created horizontal references, while measured marks on the stakes created vertical references. Once these references and grid system were established, the team began their excavation from the west edge of the mound, trawling off six-inch cuts, while maintaining a vertical wall all along the trench and working their way to the next five-foot stake, whereupon they would smooth out the newly formed horizontal area, looking for features, recording those features, and recording the vertical profile. 
It should be noted that systematic methods of sifting the removed soil had not yet been established, and Newman does not indicate that they had done so. So it is unlikely that they followed this more modern protocol. While the dig team started the excavation of DU-1, Newman, along with his peer grad students Griffin and Egan, surveyed the DU-1 mound site, establishing its precise location in the landscape. As there was nothing like GPS back at that time, they used large stationary objects in the vicinity as references. Since the CANE Railway ran east-west, just north of the site, they used the CANE Railway line and the footings of the CANE Bridge over the DuPage River as reference points, thereby triangulating the exact position of the DU-1 mound. They proceeded to dig across the face of the DU-1 mound from west to east, maintaining a vertical profile of the mound running north-south as they went. A short distance past the L1 stakes, or about three and a half feet left of the mound center, and about six inches below the mound surface, they found a single potsherd, about two and a half inches by three inches in size. The potsherd was about three sixteenths of an inch thick, or half centimeter, colored in shades of buff, or yellow, brick, or deep orange, and gray. The fabric of the clay included significant amounts of quartzite crystal, and had a rough surface, indicating that it was handmade and unturned. There was no decoration on the sherd. Based on sherd curvature, Newman deduced that the original pot was small, perhaps six inches in diameter and five inches in height. Unfortunately, he also noted that the pot sherd had been found within the debris of the Vandal Pit from 1926. This debris had been piled to the side of the pit, meaning that the pot shirt had likely been removed from its original context and therefore could no longer be reliably used to date the mound. As it was, Newman judged the shirt to be of Algonquin or woodland type and so conjectured that the mound was likely pre-European, but perhaps not too much older than that, as he felt that the mounds themselves looked fairly recent. They continued the excavation past the center of the mound, recording vertical profiles at every five-foot stake interval. At a little more than five feet east of the center of the mound, they came upon something in situ and far more promising. Newman's team had in fact discovered a burial. Newman writes, As the profile was troweled off, we happened upon the burial, which was covered by a gray silt loam and had evidently not been disturbed by the pitting. The immediate region surrounding the bones was black in color, and many stones were found at the same level immediately east of them. The burial must have been placed about six inches below the original surface of the surrounding ground. Judging from the heaviness of the long bones and the mastoid, the individual was an adult male, but not enough of the skeleton was present to make this statement definite. The whole burial consisted of a fragment of the parietal, the left mastoid portion of the temporal, and fragments of the tibia, a femur, and ulna, and a clavicle. By the position of the bones, it is evident that it was a bundle burial, and that the bones had been interred after long exposure. The condition of the bones was such that they fell apart at the slightest touch. Nothing could be preserved. Note that Newman describes it as a bundle burial, which is fairly common in effigy-type mounds. This is considered a secondary burial, where the remains of one or more individuals, after the flesh has rotted away, are tied together in a bundle, perhaps with fabric or string, and then placed in a small pit in the ground. Other types of burials in effigy mounds included cremation burials, flexed burials, where the body is laid out in a flexed or fetal position on their side, or extended burials, where the body is laid out flat. It's important to note that most effigy mounds contain no burials at all. Where there were burials in effigy mounds, they usually contained few or no grave goods associated with the remains. Many archaeologists and anthropologists see effigy mounds as being more ceremonial in nature, perhaps being used in various rituals, rather than simply in the role of funerary practices. It should also be noted that although the DU-1 burial remains are lost to us due to their decomposition, Newman's description should be considered as fairly trustworthy, 
as George Newman was to become a leading physical anthropologist in his day, and indeed later was sometimes called upon by law enforcement for his expert opinion to forensically examine human remains. Newman's team completed their excavation and work by the following weekend. Beyond the single woodland potsherd, the bundle burial, and the associated stones, they recorded no additional finds in DU-1. All totaled, they had completely excavated 44 of the 72 five-foot squares, or 61% of the total squares within their 50-foot by 45-foot grid. Approximately 70% of the total mound area of DU-1, including the entire central portion of the mound, and to a depth of one and a half feet to two feet below the original undisturbed surface of the ground was excavated. By today's standards, this amount of removal would be considered excessive, but the science of archeology span was still in its infancy when this excavation was made. And one of the key reasons why today's archeologists resist excavation, unless absolutely necessary, is that future generations may have superior tools and techniques to answer the questions that these ancient artifacts pose. Archaeology is a destructive science, meaning that once a site has been excavated, the secrets that it may hold are effectively gone forever. Had Newman's team preserved more of the DU-1 mound, future generations could have potentially used carbon-14 dating and other more exacting chemical analysis to tell a more complete story. During the investigation, Newman noted a possible Native American settlement site due east of the Player Mound Group, along the ridge just west of the DuPage River. He even assigned it the label of DU-4. Newman conjectured that it may have been a recent or historic campsite, possibly used by Sauk or Fox Native Americans, although he does not elaborate as to why he thought this was a campsite or why he thought it was more historic rather than prehistoric. Nor did his team do any investigations along this ridge. Instead, he suggested that this be included in future investigations. The U of C team departed as quickly as they had arrived, completing their work by Saturday, April 25th. Perhaps thinking that there might be some follow-up, or perhaps running out of time, they apparently did little to backfill or restore the original ground surface or mound surface, and so, DU-1 was left almost completely dismantled. George Newman never did publish the results of his investigation into the Player Mound Group in a peer-reviewed journal, meaning that the knowledge of the mound site languished in obscurity, known by few save the U of C Anthropology Department and a small number of Illinois archaeologists. It's possible that the paucity of remains at the site or the fact that it was something of a salvage operation, reduced its importance and priority in the eyes of both Faye Cooper Cole and George Newman. It's difficult to say. Faye Cooper Cole and his protégés went on to excavate many other mounds and Native American sites in the U.S. Midwest in the years to follow. And George Newman, James Griffin, Fred Egan, and Jesse Jennings would all go on to be notable archaeologists and anthropologists all significantly fleshing out the story of prehistoric Native American culture in the United States. In the 1940s, Mr. Newman joined the University of Indiana, where he did forensic anthropological research and taught until his death in 1971. James Bennett Griffin became director of the University of Michigan's Museum of Anthropology, as well as a professor in their Department of Anthropology, passing away in 1997. Frederick Russell Egan took a professorship position within the University of Chicago Anthropology Department with a long and storied career and died in 1991. Jesse Jennings did further fieldwork in Illinois and the Midwest before taking a position at the University of Utah, where he stayed till his retirement. Mr. Jennings passed away in 1997. Meanwhile, Milton and Elizabeth Player continued to farm and to raise their family on their patch of earth along the DuPage River. Milton served on the West Chicago School Board in the 1930s and retired from farming in 1947 at the age of 73. Little more is reported of the mound site for decades to come, suggesting that, to the locals at least, the site had given up its secrets. But more indeed was yet to come. In the next episode of this series on the Winfield Mounds, 
We'll advance in time to the mid-1970s, when yet another local college descended on the site, this time to focus on the village or settlement area between the mound site and the DuPage River. And we'll tell you all about that in the next video.